Okay, so this is SKEE3223 microprocessor. Okay, section 7 and 8. Okay, ini adalah untuk section 7 and 8. Right, so my name is Dr. Mama Afzal. Okay, so I hope you are in the correct sections. Okay, because due to the PKP and MCO, you cannot go to UTM. Okay, so no need to go to know my rooms lah. Okay, so anything you can email me at upside at fke.utm.my or you can send in the group, uh, in the WhatsApp groups. Okay, for those who just come in, please sign the attendance. Okay, I will already share the attendance in the chat box. Okay, so let's look at the introduction of the microprocessor. Okay, before we we go to the chapter one, the module one. Okay, so let's do the overview of this. Uh, what we call this this lectures. Okay, so the aim of this subject is to introduce the principle and the usage of the microprocessor. Okay. So, a few topics that I emphasize are processor architecture. Okay, you will learn about processor architecture, assembly language, right? And then basic interfacing. Okay, so actually, this course here uh, more focus on the programming part. Okay, you will learn in the programming in assembly language as well as a C programming. Okay, so make, make sure that you know how to what we have here to write a program okay so throughout this uh what we call this course here you will learn how to write the assembly language as well as the c programming and at the same time you you will learn also how the architecture of the processor that you're going to use Okay, so this is the learning outcome. Okay, so this learning outcome you can find in the CI, okay, course information, which is to describe and differentiate all the components of microprocessor based system. Okay, so you know that which one is used for the input output part, which one is your register. Okay, this uh, pin out here go to what port, okay, and all those things. Okay, to analyze and design every Omega assembly language program, okay, as well as a C program, CAS2, and to analyze and design every Omega 32 microprocessor system. Okay, so in this class here, we are going to use the the Omega 32, okay, chip. Okay, later you will see how much. Uh, what is the Atmega 32 chip? Okay, ada berapa banyak dia punya pin out and all those things lah. Okay, and then to work with AVR Studio and communicate effectively in a team to solve a complex AVR 32 design uh, problem. Okay, so in this class here, we are going to use the AVR Studio. Okay, to write a program, both in a C program and as well as a assembly language okay we're going to use this abr studio so what what in, in this course okay so in this course here you are going to learn about assembly language programming as as, as well as a c programming okay and then you're going to uh, learn about microprocessor concept and hardware interfacing okay how to connect your input your sensor your output your LED, for example, your switches to the microprocessor. Okay, so before you take this uh, lectures here, yeah? okay, this class, this uh, uh, microprocessor class, you need to uh, the the prerequisite subject that you need to to have is digital electronics. Okay, which is SKEE one two two three. Okay, in which inside of that digital electronic you already learn about the number representation the coding the register the state machine okay how to do the logic circuits how to integrate circuits technology and then designing the msi components flip-flop and all these things here okay so you need to know lah, all these things here because we will going to use okay especially in the number representation in this class okay so this is a cost policy Okay, attendance is compulsory. Make sure that you sign in the attendance. Okay, 
So you are responsible for whatever is taught in the lecture. If you miss a class, it's your responsibility to find out about the assignment, quizzes, and exam from my website. Okay, you can find um, all the information, all the updates from my website. Okay, which is outzen.fka.utm.my. I know some of you already took a, a digital electronic class. Okay, in my session, so you already know. Okay. So I slowly give the updates and assignment or anything is in this website here. Okay, and then let's look at the assessments. Okay, there are group assignment and presentation, which is contribute of 20% of the marks. Okay, and then we have a three test. Kita akan ada tiga test. Test one, okay. So please mark your dates here. Test one will be heard on 18 November, 18 November, okay, time 6 p.m. So, since this one year, this will be done online, okay, semua so sekali test ni akan dijadikan secara online. Okay, and then we have a test 2, okay, on the 23rd December, also at the 6 p.m. And test 3, 20 January, also at 6 p.m. Okay, so this test here, okay, will contribute 30% of your carry marks. And last but not least, it's your final exam lah. Okay, so final exam is 50%. Hopefully lah, this final exam here will be done face-to-face. -face. Okay, so harap-harap this semester, the final exam will be done face-to-face. -face. Okay, so the reference, okay, you can find this book here. Okay, this is the book that I use, okay, for these courses. Okay, this is the the previous punya edition. You can find the new edition here. Okay, and then another one here is this software. Okay, which is we use the Atmel Studio 6.2. Okay, so this software here will be used in in this class as well in your micro P lab, micro processor lab. Okay, make sure you download this software. This is a free software. Okay, you can download it from microchip.com. Okay, so for those, you can download 6.2 punya version of, or you can opt for version 7. Sama je. Okay, only the difference is the interface. Okay, and then the, of course lah, for the version 7, there are a lot of improvement, improvement compared to 6.2. Okay, so far, ada soalan tak? Any question? Up to here. Okay, because after this, we're going to start our class. Okay, uh, our first chapter here. Okay, ada soalan tak? Okay, for those who just come in, please uh, assign the attendance. Okay, I share the attendance link in the chat box. Okay, make sure you sign the attendance. Okay, so if no question, uh, no need. Okay, that reference book is just for if you want more details on the uh, microprocessor things, okay, you can get that books. Okay, otherwise, you just refer to my lecture notes. Okay, so let's look at the module one. Okay, so this is a microprocessor based system. Okay, this one here we already covered in the previous slide. Okay, so let's look what uh, the first uh, content here, what is computer? Okay, what is computer? Apa tu computer? Okay, so a computer is a, an electronic device for storing and processing data typically in a binary form according to instruction given to it by, in a variable program. Okay, so a computer is usually used to do a data processing and data storage. Okay, so kamu guna computer untuk buat processing a data as well as to store a data. Okay, so this is the basic function of computer. Okay, there are four basic functions of computer. First is your data processing. 
okay, which is you want to mat man manipulate the data to process the data, okay. So this data processing involves of of arithmetic processing, logical function, okay, and data shifting and etc. Okay, and then you have the data storage, okay, which is you want to store a data inside of your computer, and another one is a data movement okay in which you want to send in or send out the data from input to output okay from cpu to your output or from input to your cpu that is a data movement okay and the last one is your to control mechanism okay the control mechanism will control either you want to do a data movement or you want to store a data or you want to do a processing Okay, so this is the four basic function of computer. Okay, let's look at the computing system. Okay, whenever the word microprocessor is mentioned, most of us think of a desktop computer, which is a PC or laptop. Okay, maybe at most your smartphone. Lah. Okay, so in this course, we will look at another type of computer system, which is far more common than you ever imagine. Okay, every time you you heard the what uh, computer system okay you you always think of this thing lah but the computing system consists of other things that you ever imagine okay later we will see what is the other computer system available in this world all right so let's look at the classification of the computer okay we have five classification of the computer the first one is we call it as a server okay so this server is a, is a big expensive available 24 7 okay so this server here is a computer or computer program that manage as a, an access to a centralized resource or service in a network okay every time you you going to browse okay you're going to do an online browsing okay then suddenly you get the error 404 means that the server is down okay so, okay that is a server okay then you have a desktop and desktop that's so this is the common things ah. okay and then we have a previously okay a few years back we have a pda and then followed by a tab and smartphone okay so this is a common thing as, as well and last but not least is the embedded system which is a computer that don't look like a computer okay so embedded system is a computer system with a dedicated function okay within a larger mechanical or electrical system often with real-time computing constraint okay so embedded system also another set of a computer okay contoh embedded system can you give a contoh of the embedded system Okay, one of the contoh we can, uh, uh, I can give you is uh, that close to you is your calculator. Okay, okay, washing machine is as well as an embedded system. Okay, so the the calculator is a, an embedded system. All right, so so this is the embedded system okay this is the definition of the embedded system okay you can see here okay which is a microprocessor based system that is built to control a function of all a range of function okay so if this embedded system only can have a limited function dia tak boleh buat banyak okay it cannot do many things it only have a few things to do okay so it is not designed to be a program by the end user. Okay, end user cannot program this embedded system. Okay, it already programmed in, in the factory. In, okay, which is, of course, lah, the, it has a limitation compared to your PC. Because your PC, you have, you can reprogram your PC to make your PC more powerful. Okay. Okay, sekejap ya. My my what we call here. My slideshow is crash. Okay, so I need to restart the. Okay. Now, 
Okay, can you give example of the embedded system? Okay, please go to this, this slido.com and please enter this code here. Okay, we're going to, to do some exercise here. Okay, so please give an example of the embedded system. Okay, I give you three minutes. Okay, so please give example of embedded system that you have in your mind. Okay, mana lagi takkan dua orang dia respond? Okay, we have six people here. Okay, lagi, lagi, lagi. Okay, keep on coming. Okay, most of you saying that is a calculator. Okay, lagi we have a digital camera. And then we have a remote control, side light, okay, a smart watch. Okay, what else? Okay, video game console. Okay, actually, video game console nowadays, okay, for the, such as a PS4 or Xbox, is considered as a computers, okay, not as an embedded system anymore, because you can do any, everything inside of your console okay game for uh, the ps4 and xbox because you can watch a movie you can play games you can add many things to your what we call here the ps4 and xbox okay so this is the example lah. all right so i stop here okay so where is the point okay so this is the example that you give Okay, of the embedded system. Okay, next. Okay, so this, this is another example. Lah. So let's look at your car. Okay, inside of your car, there are a lot of embedded system available in, in your car. Okay, contoh lah, you have a remote keyless entry system okay and then you have an immobilizer this is for the security purpose lah. okay for the safety purpose you have the airbag okay to trigger the airbag you have a, one embedded system to trigger the airbag okay then you have a direct TPMS system okay and then occupant detection in which if your passengers are not you uh wearing the seat back and then the LED the sound will uh, the beeping sound will appear okay so this is another embedded system lah for the safety and then you have the instrumentation such as your instrumentation cluster to play a movie to play a your radio to play a, a songs okay and then for the driver assistant okay we have an additive headlights which is if there is incoming car in front so the up the headlight will automatically dim. Okay, and then you have a night vision. Okay, lane departure warning. Okay, blind spot detection as as a car. So inside of the cars, there are a lot of embedded system actually. Okay. So actually, a smartphone is not an embedded computer. Why? Because your smartphone nowadays has it has a complete system or general purpose competitive device okay because you can use to play a game you can use to make a call you can install uh, what we call it apps to to do a certain thing to to make it as a calculator so smartphone not considered as a embedded system okay dulu long time ago a uh, handphone yes we consider it as a embedded system because handphone just used to call and play games but nowadays when the smartphone is coming the smartphone can 
can, uh, you can use your smartphone you can use anything on your smartphone okay you can browse uh, internet access etc so smartphone cannot be considered as embedded system anymore okay it's considered as a computer system a generous computer okay general purpose computer uh, computer okay let's look at the the difference between the general purpose computer and the embedded system okay for the general purpose computer computer okay it intended to run a fully generous set of application okay you can run many application in the computer okay for example if you're going to to play a video okay you can install a vlc player or movie player to play a video if you're going to uh what we call to play a game, you can install the game inside of your computer. Okay, if you're going to 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 browse uh, an internet, okay, you can install a browser. Okay, so that you can browse the internet. Okay, so so the computer can do many things. Okay, so while for the embedded system. It runs a few application often known at a design time. Hanya a few application can run in the embedded system. For example, we take your calculator. Okay, so for the calculator, you can do calculation only. You cannot take the temperature, for example. Okay, because your calculator only can calculate, okay, do the calculating process, okay, Nothing else. Okay, tak boleh buat benda lain. Okay, for the general purpose computer, it is an end user programmable as I mentioned earlier. Okay, means that as I mentioned earlier, if you're going to watch a video, you can install a movie player. If you're going to watch a TV, for example, okay, you can browse to the online TV. Okay, you or you can install the what you call here AstroGo to watch a TV. Okay, so it is an end user programmable. Okay, you can reprogram your computer. But embedded system is a not end user programmable. Okay, kamu tak boleh tambah another function to that embedded system. Okay, and then general purpose of computer faster is always better. Okay, of course lah. Okay, the faster the computer, the better, the better lah. Okay, for the embedded system, Operate in a fixed runtime constraint. Additional performance may not be useful. Okay, and then this is a how to differentiate a features for the general purpose computer and embedded system. Okay, so to differentiate between one computer to another computer, we can differentiate it by using a speed, software compatibility, and the cost. Okay, why for this one here, embedded system, you can differentiate shape between one embedded system to another embedded system such as a power the cost the size and the speed okay so that that one is the the introduction part of the embedded system lah. okay so to define a microprocessor system so there are three things that you're going to know the first one is the fundamental okay you need to know what is inside of your computer and what is inside of your processor you need to know the architecture of your computer and processor okay then we have a programming okay you need to know a programming okay so how to write a program how to create a program how to run execute that program and if you have an error okay suddenly you write a program then when you try to compare a uh, compile then you got an error so how to troubleshoot that error Okay, and last but not least is hardware design. Okay, so hardware design, you will learn about how to interface between the input and output. Contohlah, you have a keyboard, how to interface your keyboard with the microprocessor. Okay, so so that's the micro, anything that you key in in the keyboard will go to the microprocessor to be processed. Okay. So let's look at the fundamental first. Okay. So the okay, we go to the internal organization of the computer. Okay, so we want to see what is inside of your computer. 
Okay, so internal working of every computer can be divided into three main parts. Okay, so there are three main parts that you need to know. Okay, inside of the computer, the first one we call it as a CPU. Sekejap ya, I want to take out the pen here. Okay, first is CPU. The second one is the memory and the third one is input output. Okay, this is the three main uh, parts that a computer needs. Okay, CPU, memory and input output device. Okay, CPU called as a central processing unit. This one, you, you need a CPU to do a data processing. Okay, either you want to do a data shifting, you want to do a addition, subtraction, arithmetic, etc. Okay, all the processing data will be done inside of your CPU. And then you need a memory. Okay, there are two types of memory. One is a random access memory. The other one is a read-only memory. This memory is used to store a data. Okay, either you store it temporarily or you want to store it forever. Okay, then we have an input-output device lah. Okay, the third one is input output device. So this one is the thing that you want to communicate between the end user, which is you, to the CPU. Okay, you have an input. Contoh input is such as a keyboard, mouse, sensor, switches, and etc. And then for the output, you have an LCD to di to display, printer, monitor, LED, and etc. Okay, so this is the three main things that you need to know inside of every computer. Okay, let's look the inside of the CPU. The uh, CPU, what, what, what are the things that that evaluate inside of the CPU? Okay, so the CPU, okay, which is uh, known as a control, uh, used to control the operation of the computer and perform its data processing function, often simply referred to as a processor. Okay, so the CPU is used to execute information and store in the memory okay so the keyword here is to execute information so any information that have in the memory you want to execute okay so the io device is used as a communication between media with a cpu so the io will communicate with the cpu okay to tell the cpu either you want to read or you want to write or anything okay and then the CPU is connected to memory and I.O. through a strip of wire called buses. Okay, there are three buses here. Okay, first is control bus, data bus, and address bus that are connected to your memory as well as your I.O. device. Okay, so let's go inside the CPU. What is the three main uh, the things that inside of your CPU? There are three main units that is inside of the CPU, but the first one we call it as a arithmetic logic unit. Okay, so you have an ALU here. Okay, this ALU, okay, to perform a arithmetic logic, uh, arithmetic operation such as plus, okay, addition, subtraction, division, or multiplication. So this is the arithmetic operation. And then you're going to do a logical function such as logical add or exclusive or exclusive no and etc. Okay, you have a lot of logical function that you learn in the digital electronics. Okay, then, okay, so this, this is your LEU. Then we have a, the control unit. Okay, so this control unit used to control and synchronize all the overall operation of the micro P and our micro control system. Okay, so this controller unit will tell the CPU, uh, will tell the CPU Either you want to read a data or to, to write a data. Okay. And then we have a register here. Okay. So a register is a set of internal storage location within a CPU. So we, inside of CPU, we have a, re, a temporary storage called a register. Okay. So bear in mind that we have two types of CPU. The first one we call it as a microprocessor, and while the second one we call it as a microcontroller. Okay, later in the 
next slide we will see what are the difference between the micro p and micro c so this is it inside of your cpu lah. okay any question sampai sini ada soalan tak ada soalan okay next we go to the memory okay so computer tadi you have three main thing that you need to have is for every computer one is cpu memory and the last one is a io okay so memory store the man used to store the binary information needed by a cpu okay there are two type of memory rom and ram okay this one you already learned inside of digital electronic so i won't cover details on these things here okay so you can refer to your digital electronics in your notes lah okay next i want to go to the buses okay so for the cpu in order for the cpu to communicate between io and memory we need a communicative communication device called a buses there are three buses available here one is a address bus the second one is your the data bus and the third one is a control bus okay if you see here the address bus is one direction okay so it's from the cpu to outside only okay while for the data bus it is a bi-directional bus okay it, it has a two-way communication kat sini kamu nampak ni ada two way of communication okay either the data going to cpu and out from the cpu and a control bus also is a bi-directional bus which is the data can come in from the cpu or going out from the cpu okay so let's look at the control bus what the control bus you do okay it's a bi-directional bus okay so this control bus here used to provide a read or write signal okay read and write signal to the device indicate if the cpu is asking for information or sending and information for example okay you're going to read an information and uh, you're going to read a data from your input okay so the control bus will send a read signal okay we should it asking an information from your input okay if you're going to set out the data from cpu okay to your what we call here to your monitor for example okay what you're going to do is the control bus will give a write signal okay which is to send a signal to send an information from cpu to the output okay so this is the Okay, this is the function of the control bus. Okay, it is to, to ni lah, what we call here, to determine either you want to read a data or to write a data. Okay, and then we have a data bus. Okay, so data bus is a bidirectional bus. Okay, we already, and it's used to carry information in and out of a CPU. Okay. So when this control pass here, when you say, okay, I want to read a data. Okay, means that the data will come in from the, this data bus. They akan masuk melalui data bus from input to your CPU. Okay, if you saying that the control bus saying that you want to write a data, okay, you send a signal write, means that you're going to send the data from CPU to your output okay so the data will go through through this data bus here they are coming with this data bus okay okay the more data bus available the better the cpu but more expensive okay for example okay now uh what is the what we call here Okay, for example, now we have a 64-bit computer. Betul ke tak? Okay, so now we have a 60-bit computer. Okay, a few years back, okay, our computer only has 8-bit computer. 
Okay, this eight bit and sixty four represent the, the the data bus here, the size of your data bus. Okay, so if you see here, the eight bit computer much cheaper compared to sixty bit computer. Okay, because you see, the better the CPU, okay, the higher the data bus, the the better the CPU, but the value is more expensive okay for example we take this this as, as example okay you want to to send out a 60 bit data kamu nak hantar 60 bit data okay so you have a 8 bit cpu and then you have a 16 bit cpu 32 bit cpu and last one you have the most superpower is 60 bit cpu Okay, untuk 8 bit CPU, okay, because the size of this data pass here only 8 bit, hanya 8 bit je kat sini. Okay, you can send out 8 bit data at one time. But, your data now is 64. Okay, you want to send out a 64 data. What you're going to do is, at one time you only can send 8 bit data. So, what happened is, okay, this data here, this 64 bit data will be turned into 8 bit data. Akan dibahagi kepada... 8 bit data which is 68 by divided by 8 so tot, sama dengan 8 times ok means that you need to send out 8 bit data 8 times ok to make it as a 64 bit data let's say lah ok uh, the speed of this CPU is, here is 8 bit per second ok to send the data from CPU to output, the, this data lah, this 64 data from CPU to output, okay, by using the 8 bit CPU, you requires 8 seconds, okay. Okay, because 1 second, you only can send 8 bit data. Okay, so because to send out the what we call here 64 bit data, you require 8 times. Okay, 8 kali kamu kena hantar this data here to make it as a 64 data. So you require 8 second. Okay, for the 60 bit, okay, you have 64 data. Okay, one data uh, at one time you can only send a 60 bit. Okay, data, what happens is 64 bagi divided by 16 okay this is four times so this is four seconds okay because this is a 16 bit per second lah. okay 16 bit per second every time you're going, going to send out the data so what i found about 32 okay 64 by so this one is two times okay require two seconds and if you're going to use the 60 bit cpu weapon is Okay, so you have a 64 bit data, 64 by 64. Okay, you one time. So this this one is one second. Okay, the time to send out the 60 bit data only one second. If you using a 60 bit 64 bit CPU, but if you using a 8 bit CPU, you need eight second to send out the 16 bit data okay so this okay that's why lah kat sini the more the data bus available the better the CPU and the the faster the data transmission okay next we have an address bus okay it's a undirectional bus okay it, it have one directional only if you can see hanya ada satu je from CPU to input output okay so this one here used to identify the device and memory connected to cpu okay so this address wise are used as a id okay used to identify the devices okay for a device to be recognized by a cpu it must be assigned by a unique address okay contohlah macam ni lah okay you want to send a letter or 
post uh, postcard to your friends okay you need to have the house address of your friends okay so sama juga dengan ni okay if you same applies to this one here okay if you're going to read a data from a keyboard you need to know what is the keyboard address okay if you're going to send a data to monitor you need to know what is your monitor address okay so the cpu put the address which is in binary on the address bus and the decoded circuit find find the device okay can i because uh, can i take a five minute break because there are somebody outside of my room boleh eh? we take a five minute break okay come in Okay, so any question up until then? Ada soalan tak sampai buses? Okay, so because the the first two chapter is all about the theoretical parts. Okay, it's quite boring because I'm not the storyteller guys. Okay, I'm more the technical guys. Okay, so <laughs> tak pandai nak bercerita. So maybe quite boring lah for you. Okay, so this one here, actually, you can read it by your own, actually. Okay, now we will go to microprocessor. Uh, this, the next slide is for microprocessor. Right. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, we have two type of CPU. Okay, kita ada dua type of CPU. One, we call it as a, what we call, a micro P, and the other one is a microcontroller. Okay, micro P and micro C. Now you're going to see what are the difference between a micro P and micro C. Okay, let's look at the microprocessor first. Okay, the first CPU. Okay, so microprocessor is a single integrated circuit that accept and execute coded instruction, which is either a machine code or machine language, for the purpose of manipulating data and controlling the associate circuitry such as RAM, ROM IO in the digital system. Okay, so this is a micro P. Okay, micro P, microprocessor or micro P by itself, it is a completely useless. Okay, kalau kamu beli, if you buy a micro P IC or micro P chip only, it a completely useless. Tak guna. Why? Because you need to have external peripherals to interact with our outside world. 
okay recall back okay for the computer system okay there are three main things that every computer system should have okay the first one is cpu okay of course lah, you buy a micro p chip you have a cpu memory do you have a memory inside of this micro p chip doesn't have a memory and then the the third one is io do you have input output peripheral inside a micro p chip no you doesn't have the input output peripherals so that's why if you buy a micro p chip it completely useless okay you need to have an external preference such as memory and IO to make it works. Okay, untuk jadikan dia one complete system. Okay, so this is your memory. And this is your IO. Okay, so you need to buy lah. You need to buy another chip for the memory and another chip for your IO. Okay, so that is a micro microprocessor. Okay, next is a micro C. Micro C also is a single integrated circuit. Okay, so when you buy a micro C, it's some you can dapat bentuk macam ni lah. This is the microcontroller punya IC. Why? This is the micro P punya IC. Okay, the same thing. Benda sama dalam bentuk integrated circuit. Okay, this is also inside the Okay, also in the integrated circuit. But this one here, okay, that accept and execute coding instruction for the purpose of manipulating data and controlling the digital system similar to micro P. Okay, the, okay, it work the same way, uh, the same as the, your micro P. But the difference between micro P and micro C is that the micro C contains RAM, ROM, I.O. in that single IC package means that if you buy this IC here, you already have the CPU and then you have a memory inside here and you also have the, what we call here, the IO peripheral inside. Okay. Those allow miniaturization of single application because the required associated circuit is contained within the IC of your microcontroller. So that is the difference between micro p and micro c okay if you buy a micro c okay this is your micro c punya chip and oh, sorry micro p punya chip it only consists of your cpu memory tak ada doesn't have a memory also don't have a io okay while if you buy a ic a microcontroller you have a cpu inside here memory and input output peripheral okay any question Ada soalan tak? Okay, so this is the microcontroller. All of these thing here are inside of your microcontroller IC. Okay, let's look at the the what we call it, the difference between my the other difference between micro P and micro C. First, microprocessor a chip that contains only the CPU, okay, hanya ada CPU saja, but for the microcontroller, a chip that contain all the component of the computer, which is you have a CPU, you have a memory, and yes, that you have the input output peripheral. Okay, so microprocessor needs other chips to make a working system. Okay, so to make a working system, you need to buy a memory chips and then you need to buy high o peripheral chips and do the connection to it do, to your cpu so that it you can make it as a working system okay microprocessor it is more fl flexible compared to the microcontroller why this one is more flexible why this is a less flexible because for the for this one here okay lah contoh lah macam ni Okay, so now you go to kedai. Okay, you go to shop. You buy a microcontroller. Okay, you buy a micro C. Okay, which is support of 8 input output. 8 I.O. Or sometimes we call it as GPIO. Okay, you have 
Okay, you go to the kedai and then you buy this chip here. This chip only support up to 8 input output. Okay, you're going to do a, what we call here your FYP, your final year project. Okay, so in, in your my, uh, projects, okay, you're going to use 12 input output. Okay, you have a lot of sensors, you have a lot of LEDs to, in, to connect to your microphone because this one here. When you buy this chip here, it only support up to eight only. So you cannot, you no longer cannot, you no longer can use this IC, okay, this micro C. So you need, you need to buy a new one with that can support up to this 2012 input output, okay, peripherals. But for the micro P, okay, you buy a micro P, so, so this is your micro P, and then Okay, you're going to what we call here uh, to do the same circuit which is support up to 12 IO uh, input output. So what you're going to do, you just buy the IO peripheral chip that support to this one here, this number here. Okay, no need to buy this micro P chip again. But this one here, so you need to buy the whole thing again. Okay, so this one you just, okay, you just buy the IO punya. Peripherals. Okay, so that's why this get this one more flexible compared this to micro C. Okay, can have a very few I/O or many I/O devices using the same processor chip. This one here, less component count in a system. Of course, of course, lah, because this one, uh, the micro C is the chip is very small, so the number of GPIO supported is limited, lah. Okay, so and it is a less powerful. Okay, why this is less powerful compared to this one? Okay, contohlah this one here, kalau kamu nak jadikan dia powerful, okay, to have a, a higher RAM and higher ROM, so you just buy the memory punya chip compared to this one. This one, it is already dedicated punya memory and memory, your, your memory is the set dah kat sini. Okay, compared to this one. This one you can buy if you want to increase the memory. So you just need to buy the memory chip. Okay. Okay, that is the fundamental. Okay, we, we finish the fundamental part. Okay, you already learned about what is inside a computer and what is inside a processor. Now we're going to look at the programming part. Okay. Okay, first thing first, you need to know the software. Okay, so the, the computer software, which is a computer program that are known as a software. Okay, so you have a lot of computer software. Contoh, in this class here, okay, to we are using the AVR Studio software. Okay, in order to write a C programming or assembly language. Okay, and then next, we have a program. Program is a sequence of instruction that perform a task. Okay, so this is a program. Okay, so you have multiple instruction that perform a few tasks. Okay, and then you have the instruction, the simplest operation performed by the processor. Okay, think of it as a note of coming from the musical instrument. So this is the instruction. Okay, this is the first instruction and this is the second instruction. Okay, if you combine the instruction, you can make it as a program. Okay, kalau kamu combine kan, this instruction here, it will, you can make it as a program. And when you program, uh, you com, com, combine this, a few program, you, you can come up with a computer software. So how the computer works, okay. It is use a fetch and instruction from memory. Okay, first, the computer will fetch the instruction from the memory and then it will decode the instruction and it execute the instruction. So, for example, lah, you have this instruction here. So, you're going to see how the computer works. Macam mana computer to fetch and execute this instruction. Okay, so this one here we, we will see in the next slide. Okay, how the computer works. 
Okay. So let's look at the language. Yeah. Okay. So this is the language. Okay. You have a high level language. Okay. Contoh high level language such as Pascal, C, Fortran, Java. You have the a lot of language out there. PHP and etc. Okay. Python. Okay. Then at the top of this uh, at the Okay, this at the top of the uh, what you call pyram py uh, pyramid here, you have a high level language followed by assembly language, and then after that is a machine language, and last but not least is your hardware. Lah. Okay, so the machine language is the lowest level programming language. Okay, they do not about what's called in it. This is your machine language. Okay, it is a set of instructions that executed directly by CPU. Okay, so CPU will use the machine language. To execute an instruction. Okay, so it is while easily understood by a computer, machine language are almost impossible for human to use because they are consist entirely of numbers, which is in either in binary number or in hexa decimal number. So this is the example of machine language. Okay, it consists of numbers. So you cannot know what this number represents. Okay, so after the machine language, we have the assembly language. Okay, so this, okay, at my right, right hand side, yeah, this is your assembly language. Okay, this is machine. This is, okay, for the assembly language, okay, it is represented by a minimum representation. Okay, you can see here, push, move, and sub. Okay, so you might know lah. Okay, you might have a clue what this instruction do. Compared to machine language, they only conceive of the numbers. Okay, you cannot do what this fifty five do. What is eight ninety five do? Okay, what is the instruction behind of this code here? But if you see the assembly language, okay, you see push. Okay, you might have a clue. Okay, this one you are going to push to put a what we call here to put a data to your step pointer for example. Okay, let's look at this one here. Sub. What this sub do? Kalau kamu rasa what the SUB do? Subtract. Yes, the SUB stand for subtract. What about MOV? MOV, guys. MOV to move a data from one register to movie. Not movie. It's a move a data. Okay, from one register to another register. Okay, so assembly language a low lower level programming language for a computer. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, it's use a mnemonic representation. Okay, to represent each low level machine operation. Contohnya, okay, you have MUL stand for multiply. Okay, you have ADD stand for addition, SUB for subtraction. Apa lagi kita ada? Ah, uh, we have LD to load a data, MOV to move a data, and we have a few more instruction. Okay, later you, you will learn all of this minimum instruction. Okay, so assembly language is converted into executive machine code by a utility program referred to as assembler. Okay, the conversion process is referred to as assembler or SMB code. Okay, so by using an assembler, okay, it will decode Okay, it will convert this minimum representation to machine language so that the CPU know what you're going to do. What the, what you're going to do, what you are uh, you uh, what you try to program. Okay, so assembler can be two types. Okay, first is cross assembler, and the second one is a native assembler. The difference between cross assembler and native assembler is that the cross assembler, okay. It run on one computer and generate machine instruction that will be executed by another computer. Means that like you write an assembly language to one computer and then you generate a machine code that will be run to another computer. While the native assembler run and generate instruction for the same computer. Means that like you write down the assembly language at computer one and at and at the same time, you can run the 
what we call here the machine code from the same computer. Okay, so the drawback of assembly program are dependent on hardware organization. Okay, of course lah. For assembly language, you need to know the the architecture of your CPU, architecture of your hardware, how many input output available, how many red, what is the size of your RAM, what is the size of your program memory and etc. Okay, you need to take, you need to consider all those things before you write a program. Okay, difficult to understand a long program. Okay, so if you have a very long program, it's difficult to you to troubleshoot and understand. Kalau simple progress, something like this, senang lah. If you have a long program, so it will be very difficult to understand compared to C programming. And low programmer productivity. Okay. Any question up until I saw that? Don't know what to happen. Okay, never mind. Okay, next we going to see the fetch and execute cycle. Okay, so so kat sini kita nak tengok macam mana how the computer works, how the computer read the instruction. Okay, how the CPU read the instruction and execute the instruction that you already program. Okay, so the processor execute instruction one by one according to the sequence found in the memory. Okay, contoh lah. This is your program. Okay. So the CPU will execute one by one. Okay. Starting from here. Then execute. And then it go to here. Execute here. Until your last program. Okay. It will start one by one from top to bottom. Okay. So everything is controlled by the control unit inside of the CPU. Okay. To execute an instruction, the processor must fetch it from a memory. Okay. Because why? Because this program here, okay, you will store this program here in the program memory. Okay. Because before I proceed uh, with more detail about fetch and execute, I just want to to give you an overview how uh, the how, how the memory inside your, of your art mega 32 looks like okay for the art mega 32 you have three memory then okay yang kamu kena tahu first we call it as a flash memory ataupun program memory okay you have three memory and then you have a data memory Okay, this is a program memory. And the last one is the least significant. Lah. I call it the least significant punya memory is EEPROM memory. Okay, we only focus on these two here. Okay, data memory and program memory. Okay, program memory used to store all the program that you're going to write. So, small instruction or program or Anything that you write in your programming will be stored inside here. I can be tulis be simpan kat sini. Okay. Once you're going to execute each line of the instruction here, kamu akan, you will use the data memory. You will, you will store all this thing here. Okay. All this value here inside of your data memory kat sini. Okay. The data memory can be, div, div, can be divided into three parts. One, we call it as a GPR, followed by I.O. memory, and last kali is your RAM. Okay, in the module 2, you will learn more detail about this thing. Okay, GPR, I.O. and RAM. Okay, so to execute an instruction, one contoh lah, you have this instruction, yeah, load I, R16, uh, one seven for example. Okay, to execute the instruction, what happened is you need to fetch this instruction that are stored inside of this 
program memory. Okay, kamu kena ambil dulu. You need to take out the instruction that store in the flash memory and put it inside of your CPU. Okay, then when you fetch the, this instruction, then what happen is the CPU will execute the instruction one. Okay, the CPU will after you fetch this instruction from the memory, the CPU will decode this instruction and execute. Okay, and then after execute, what happen is you need to fetch another instruction. So this one we call it is a instruction cycle, ataupun dipanggil sebagai fetch execute cycle. First, you fetch and then you execute and then you fetch again the instruction, you, exe you execute the instruction, fetch and execute. Okay, so that, this one we call it as a fetch execute cycle. Okay, later we will see how the fetch execute cycle works. Okay, this is the instruction cycle display. Okay, so on program start, what happens is you load the program counter PC with the address of the first instruction and then when, then you have the fetch page, okay, pass up fetch, read the instruction and put into your instruction register, control unit, decode the instruction, update the PC for the next instruction, and then you have the execute your page, find the data required by the instruction, perform the required operation, store the result and repeat from step one. Okay, so this is instruction cycle example. Okay, so I will show you how there is the fetch and execute works. Okay, come on here. Okay, can you see this this AVR program here? Nampak tak? Okay, I just put this one here. Okay, put it as a comment. Okay, so this is the AVR Studio that you are going to use in this course as well as your microprocessor lab. Lah. Okay, so this is the instruction that I already, I already, I already what we call here, right? Okay, first thing first, okay, what you're going to do is, first you go to build, and then, okay, uh, okay, I uh, ajar you how to use this thing lah, okay, sekejap kita pangkah dulu. Okay, sekejap ya. Okay, I open this AVR Studio. Okay, so this is your AVR Studio. Okay, I use the 6.2 Atman Studio. 6.2. Okay, first thing first, what you're going to do is you go to the new project. Okay, here you can pilih lah. You can choose either you want to write in assembly or C programming. Okay, so in this case here, I'm going to write in assembly language. Okay, and then I put the name lah. Okay, the name of the file that I'm going to to put here. Contoh lah, I put a uh, example. Okay, and then this is the location that you're going to to save the file. Okay, next, what you're going to do is you need to to select the the microprocessor that you're going to use so in this case here because we're going to use the atmega 32 so i just find out the atmega 30 hue kat sini okay you can scroll this one here ataupun you just simply write at atmeg 
GA32. Okay. So this one here, you just simply click. Okay, for the Omega 32, you have, sometimes you have the Omega 32 and sometimes you, you check Omega 32A. Okay. So depending lah, kalau let's say lah you buy your your chips and when you try to burn, your program does it, does not work. So you need to pilih, you select this Art Mega 32A. Okay, so we just select the Art Mega 32A here. Okay, so you see something like this. Okay, then you start write down your program lah. Okay, I put the same program. Okay, next what you're going to do is, okay, we need to see lah. Okay, we need to build our program. Okay, so that we want to to find either this program is correct or not. Is it have any error or not? So you go to build solution, and then you see down here. Okay, if the bit succeeded, okay, it means that this program here doesn't have any error. Okay, contoh lah, I put something that. A D D. Okay, so I build this one. Okay, you see, you have an error here. Dekat mana error tu? Dekat sini. It's already pointed here. A D D. Okay, so A D D should be have from register to register lah. Okay, later you will learn how to write this instruction here. Okay, so I build again. Okay, now I want to debug this instruction here. Okay, I want to see what happened for the each of this instruction. Okay, each line of this instruction. So I go to debug and start debugging and breaks. And you you got an error here. Okay, so it, it asks you to select the interface that you're going to use. Okay, so this one you we just okay select a sim simulator. And then you go again, start debugging and break. Okay, so here, if you see here, kat sini. Okay, you can see the program counter. Okay, this is the what we call the register. Okay, that you need to know, uh, the, reg reg the register that you need to know, okay, inside of your app. Mega 32. Okay, we have a program counter, step pointer, X register, Y register, Z register, status register. Okay, then you have the cycle counter, frequency, and this is another register. Okay, starting from R0 to R31. Okay, R0 to R31, actually, this is your general purpose register. Okay, yang ni general purpose register, this is, an, this is another register sah, inside of Mega. 32. Later you will learn what is the pro program counter do, what the pointer register X, Y, Z do, what is the status register show and all those things. Okay, so catch me. Okay, you have a memory here. Okay, you can go here, debug, windows and you can, okay, pilih how many memory that you want to display. Okay, in this case, I just want to display one memory. Okay. So, kat sini you can pilih lah, select lah. Program flash actually is your program memory. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, you have for Armega 32, you have three memories. Program memory, data memory and EPROM. Okay, first is your program flash, which is your program memory. And then data, IRAM, this is your inside of your data memory. And then also you have a EPROM punya memory. Okay, so in this case, I want to see inside of your file. RAM. Okay. My data memory. Okay. As you can see here, okay, this uh, yellow color here means that you're going to fetch this instruction, load IR60OX127. Okay. From the program memory. Okay. Before I proceed with that, okay, kita tengok kat sini. Okay. Debug window and I show your disassembly okay you see here this load this is this is the what we call the program okay this program here that you save inside of your program memory so this is the address okay at the left hand side here can see from here to here this is your address of each of this instruction okay since this one here 
we start dekat address 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay, so that's why load I up 60 or at 17 is stored dekat address 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 inside of your program MB. Okay, the second instruction which is load I R70 O L 0 A is stored at 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 1 in your program MB. Okay, for example, okay, so this one here, I put something like this. Okay, dot .org means that you want to origin. Okay, you want to start this instruction here dekat alamat berapa? Okay, with starting address of 30. Okay, dekat 30. Okay, so I build a solution. Yes, I want to stop the up. And then, start at the bagian breaks again. Okay, you see ya. Eh, dekat this assembly, what happened is, dekat 000, 000 no longer have the, what we call here, the instruction. Okay, why? Because your instruction here started dekat alamat, origin dekat alamat 30. Okay, the, this program, this instruction is stored starting at address 30. So you go to address 30. Okay, you see? Address 30, you have the load I R60 or at 70. Okay, and then follow lah by the, the next instruction lah. You have proper instruction ni? 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 instruction. Okay, so you have 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Okay, the NOP, the address is at address 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, Okay, so you see that this is your program counter. Okay, this is the program counter. So every time you're going to do a execute, fetch and execute, you need to, to see your program counter. Okay, so here I go to debug. Okay, so I want, okay, I want, okay, so I just, okay, I want to see where is my program content. Okay, so see, kat sini, this is my program content. The yellow line here, this is my program content. You see, my program content now point to address 30, 30, in which the program counter fetch the, the first instruction that are stored at address 30, address 30. Okay. okay, which is this instruction, load I up 16 or X 70. Okay, dekat address mana? 30. Okay, so it fetch this instruction that are stored at address 30 inside of my program memory. And then, you see here, okay, all the registers here, the value inside all of this register here, zero. Okay. The initial value is 0. Okay. So, I press F10. Ataupun, okay, you can simply go here. Step over. Okay, you click the step over. What happened? You see the program counter increase to 31. Okay, means that the program counter now want to fetch the second line here. Okay, the second instruction with, which is load I R1710. So, what happened now? Before it fetch the uh, before it fetch the next instruction, it's already execute this instruction load i r sixteen o x seventeen. So this load i, what this load i do is, you want to put value one seven in hexa decimal to r sixteen. So you see the r r number this is your r sixteen. The r sixteen now have the value one seven. Okay. So we just execute this instruction, the first instruction. Next, we are going to fetch the second instruction. This is how the fetch and execute cycles works. Okay, next. Okay, so kita tekan lagi F10. Okay, we press the F10. Okay, so now, now what happened is we execute this instruction. Okay, load I R1710. Okay, what happened is you want to put one 10 in decimal to R17. You see, inside R17, you have a new value OA. Okay, now you know that every time you put the symbol, okay, every time you put a symbol, the, the symbol in front of your number, it will represent the type of the that number. Okay, if you put X or dollar sign, it will represent a hexadecimal number. 
Okay, kalau kamu letak X or dollar sign in front of this value, it will represent the hexadecimal number. If you not put anything, any symbol in front of this number here, you know that this is decimal number. Okay, no sign or no symbol is a decimal number. Okay, if you have a, what we call here 0B, okay, Need zero, eh? zero eh? or zero base. So this one here is for binary number. Sama dengan binary number. Okay, so you need to take to a. Uh, you need to ni lah. To know lah what number that you're going to use here. Either you're going to use the hexadecimal number or decimal number or binary number. Okay, so you see here ten ten in decimal. Okay, which is Convert to binary is A. Okay. Okay. So you put 0 A to R 17. And then you see here. Next instruction that you're going to fetch is at address 32. Which is A, D, D, R, 16, R, 17. Okay. You refer back kat sini. Oh, betul. Okay. Address 32. You have instruction. The next instruction is A, D, D, R, 16, R, 17. Which is you want to add without a. Okay. okay, so what happened here? You want going to add 0A plus with 17 and put the result to R16. Okay, you want to. Okay, so this instruction, what happened here? You want to. R16 plus with R17. Okay, the value inside R16 plus we have value inside R17. And put the result into R16. Okay, so we see what happened. Okay, you see the R16 now, the value of R16 has changed. Okay, from 17 to 21. Okay, please press the calculator. Is it correct? What OA plus 17 equal to 21. Betul tak? Somebody. Please press the calculator. Okay. So the R16 now have a new value. Okay. After you do this addition. Okay. Next, you're going to execute. Okay. The program counter point to address 33, which is you're going to execute the next instruction, which is STS. OX 61 R 16. So what this STS do? You're going to store this value 21 from R 16 to alamat to address 61 inside of your RAM. So this is your RAM. Okay, so this is your RAM. Okay, you see this RAM here. You have this is alamat 60. This is 61, 62, and this. This one here belong to 70, this 18, 19, and etc. Lah. Okay, so now we press the F10 again. So what happened? You see here. Okay. At address 61, you store the value from R16. Okay. The value from R16. What is the value R16? 21. You store here. Dekat alamat 61. So, this is how the fetch and execute cycle works. Okay, you fetch the instruction. After that, the CPU will execute. Fetch instruction, execute, fetch and execute. So, any question? Sampai sini ada soalan tak? Because we finish our class. Okay, we finish our module. This is the end of module 1. Any question, guys? Other soalan? Because uh, before we end our class.
okay for the recording uh maybe i will upload okay uh, i will give you the what we call here uh, the youtube channel okay i already done a, uh, a few video uh, a few lecture recorded okay and uploaded inside of that youtube okay you can later i will give you the the links Okay, any other question? Yes, you can download this software free. Okay, you can just Google AVR Studio 6 or AVR Studio 7. Okay, and then you download it for free. Okay, if no question, I think we stop and Yes, we you will learn this thing here. Okay, this instruction, each of the instruction, more detail in the futures, right? Okay, thank you, class.